Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Michelle Leslie. And I'm Amy Spreeman. Has someone ever called you a Pharisee just because of your faithfulness to Scripture? That's never a nice feeling, and no one wants to be a Pharisee, especially not for standing on God's Word. That's right. I mean, that's that's called playing the Pharisee card, and it's it's usually dealt by someone whose deck is full of deceit. And, and for those yeah. these dealers, truth is hard to hear. It's easier to just shut down the truth teller. Well, in this episode, we're going to talk about the irony of the Pharisee card and what you can do if someone plays that card on you. You know, Amy, I've been called a Pharisee a lot of times in my ministry, usually when I warn people about false teachers, you know, it's, it's crazy how people just, they just don't want to hear the truth. And even though they're professing Christians, people just get so angry when you uh, sort of tip their sacred cows. What about you? Have you ever had that experience? Yeah, I have as well. And really for the same reasons, it's when you expose a a teacher who is uh, endangering the flock. Um, In fact, just recently, a pastor came to the comment section of my blog, Berean Research, and basically told me uh, he thought that millions of people are in the kingdom of God because of Kenneth Copeland, and that I will be judged rather harshly for my pharisaical heresy hunting. Um, so, So there's that. But Kenneth Copeland, by the way, is a wolf in sheep's clothing, ladies, and he teaches the word of faith heresy, and he also claims that he can control the weather, among uh, many other things that he teaches, so so that's one to mark and avoid. Um, But this is what happens when you expose darkness to light, and those of us, like Michelle and I, who've done this kind of apologetics are used to these accusations. Uh, Most of us will just take the time to prayerfully examine ourselves and make sure that in all humility, we are not being haughty or self-righteous, but truly warning people from a motive of loving our brothers and sisters. Uh, Then we can do what needs to be done. I I say most people because there are some who have blogs or podcasts and YouTube channels who are not humble and who are slanderers. You will know them by their fruit, and they give all discernment ministries a black eye. And by the way, no one who works in a so-called discernment ministry likes the term a discernment ministry. It's a term we're all stuck with, so we reluctantly use it to get the point across. But in reality, we all, you, me, all of us, we need to get our discernment by being a Berean, like it says in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Um, In other words, being a student of the Bible so that we know it well enough to be able to determine truth from sort of truth. Now, that being said, we're also told in Scripture to be wise about what the enemy is up to and his methods of deception. Yeah, and these days we're seeing the great falling away in the visible church that Jesus warned about, and we unapologetically are committed to letting Christians know where those dangerous deceptions are coming from so that we can mark and avoid those who are teaching these things. And yes, a lot of pastors are angry and offended by this, and they call us Pharisees and haters, and maybe they think we're too black and white, or they call us unloving or void of grace, and the list just goes on and on and on. But playing the Pharisee card typically refers to some Christian, some Christian accusing another of being pharisaical, just like playing the race card. It's used to gain an argumentative advantage over another and to discredit a fellow believer's contentions. It's really an ad hominem attack. Just It's just name calling. Like if you state a fact and then I call you a silly lunkhead or something like that, and now you're discredited in the eyes of other people. Yes, Christians who are the victims of the dreaded Pharisee card are all too often just those who have the moral courage to stand up and defend doctrinal purity in the church. They stand for righteousness and holy living, and yet they are unjustly, unfairly portrayed as too narrow-minded, like you said, Michelle, too legalistic, unloving, intolerant, and without compassion. 
and in these days of being politically correct or riding the fence to please everyone it seems that no one wants to be discredited and no one wants to be the object of ridicule you know understandable until uh, and, until it goes south because there seems to be now a fear of speaking up and stating the truth plainly just because someone might call you a pharisee or worse even though jesus said that you would be hated on account of him and by the way being a people pleaser is a sin paul tells us so in galatians one ten for am i now seeking the approval of man or of god or am i trying to please man if i were still trying to please man i would not be a servant of christ paul is saying people pleasing is the opposite of serving christ and uh, if you've ever tried to straddle a fence you're going to feel some pain and it won't be pretty so why do people use the term pharisee as a pejorative for shutting down conversation you know what image comes to mind when you think of a pharisee someone who is rigid or grumpy ignorant abusive well in scripture jesus encountered pharisees and he had a few choice words for them that's right let's let's go to scripture and look at those pharisees who were they the Pharisees were mentioned 98 times in the New Testament, mainly in the Gospels. They were an influential religious sect within Judaism at the time uh, of Christ and the early church. The Sanhedrin was a Jewish court system made up of two factions. The Pharisees were one faction and the Sadducees were the other. They ruled from the 3rd century BC to the 4th century AD. The Pharisees were known for their emphasis on personal piety, their acceptance of oral tradition in addition to the written law, and teaching that all Jews should observe all 600 plus laws in the Torah, including the rituals concerning ceremonial purification. These were the most educated Jews uh, of Jews and spent their lives in the study of the Torah law. They not only studied law, they taught that the law was the only way to God, but they also believed that oral law or the traditions of the elders and its interpretation was just as authoritative as the law of Moses. Yeah, they were so self-righteous that they could not recognize the Messiah when he stood right in front of them because he didn't fit their vision of who he would be. Jesus' words about the Pharisees and to the Pharisees are really interesting. In Matthew 23, 3, uh, Jesus tells the people, and uh, the heading in my Bible says this, a warning against hypocrisy. It says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. Now, Michelle, in that same chapter, a little later, Matthew records Jesus pronouncing seven woes unto the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. So let's let's just read through these. I'm going to start with the first one. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. And the second one is... Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much of a child of hell as you are. And yeah, the next is, Woe to you, blind guides! You say, If anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools! Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, If anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. 
You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. The fourth one is... Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind gods, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. And number five, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean out the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Number six is this. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And the seventh woe is... Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started." Wow, Michelle, those on the receiving end of these rebukes must have been shocked and ashamed. Yeah, especially at Jesus' next words after he pronounces the seven woes. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come on this generation. And so to sum it up, here is why Jesus faulted the Pharisees. It's because they twisted the absolute truth of God's word, and the way they made up the clear teachings of Scripture, they made those null and void to accommodate the opinions and traditions of men, and that they laid burdens on the others that they were unwilling to carry themselves, leveling at them the charge of hypocrites. Jesus called out four things here. He called out their doctrinal error, their unrighteous actions, their true identity, and their upcoming judgment. It's not because they were exposing lies or calling out false teachers. They weren't concerned at all with doctrinal purity. Jesus never accused them of being doctrinal purists. He accused them of being false teachers who abandoned the truth of God's word in favor of the erroneous word of man. Jesus warned his disciples to be careful, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He pointed out to the words of Isaiah, saying that his uh, prophecy about the Pharisees was right on back then, uh, which was, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Yes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the other group of teachers of, in that day, were at odds on many points of doctrine, but one thing they did agree on was that Jesus was their enemy and must be eliminated. So today, when someone is called a Pharisee, it's meant not only as a mean-spirited, uh, contentious person, it's meant as being an enemy of Christ. It's a tactic that works beautifully. Those dealing the Pharisee card know that many Christians would rather suffer silently under false teaching than speak up and risk being labeled a Pharisee. So we want to spend some time encouraging you. If you've ever had this card played on you, if you truly are humble in your approach and not contentious, if your heart is for the truth and for those dear ones being deceived, then you need to keep standing firm on the truth, truth in love. 
We must always avoid slandering someone by calling them what they are not. But it's equally true that when God is slandered by false teachers who claim to teach in his name, we must call them out for what they are. And remember, Jesus called Christians who demanded doctrinal purity disciples, not Pharisees. Here's what he said in John 8, 31 through 32. He said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Yeah, those should be really comforting words, Michelle. And the Bible is full of warnings in both the Old and New Testaments. Uh, You know, they are there because God loves us and he wants us to turn from that which will harm us or lead us into great danger, whether it is a warning about falling away or a warning about judgment to come if sinners will not repent and turn away from their sin. These warnings are given in love and they need to be taken seriously. We We are called to warn, to challenge, to alert, and to rebuke when necessary. Again, this is something that we do not because we hate these dear ones, but because we love them. When we refuse to warn someone of some great danger ahead, we fail to love them, and we are going to be held accountable for that. And I think the book of Jude is a, really a great place to be encouraged. Jude, Jesus' half-brother, writes that we are called to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. That's in Jude, uh, right away, chapter 1, verse 3. And then at the end of that chapter, we're told that we are also to persevere. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Those who love the truth must learn how to show bold conviction. If you see something, say something. We've heard that before for sure, and it really applies to this too. That's that's called polemics, the practice of engaging in public debate and dispute. Polemics isn't about showing off our theological skills. That that just points to ourselves, and that's sin, so we don't want to do that. But polemics is about rebuking those who are spreading error with the motive of concern for those who are caught up in their lies. Like the ancient heretics of Crete in the book of Titus, today's false teachers must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. And we we hear that in Titus 1.11. Yeah, ladies, don't be afraid to stand up for what is right and what is true. You are protecting those that God has providentially put in your path for his glory. And no, you're not being a legalist or a busybody by speaking up. When you see that someone is following a false teaching, ask God to strengthen you and give you the words of wisdom to say something that would help them in that moment. And we hope you know that those words ought to be from God's word. The best way to equip you for those moments is to be in your Bible and to know it well. That's called prepping. Doctrine matters. So if you're a Christian and you are my friend, then I have not only the right, but the responsibility to have a friend frank talk with you. That's right. Yeah, you know, as as we talk about this, um it has it has always occurred to me that you know, the the Pharisees were the false teachers of Jesus day and their false teaching was legalism. And so they thought that Jesus and his disciples who were just obeying what God's word actually says, they thought they were antinomians or people who um 
people who take advantage of God's grace. You know, they would be like people today who say, oh, I can do whatever I want. Jesus will just forgive me. Yes. You know, and, and, uh, you know, sinning so that grace may that much more abound. And so that's what was going on in Jesus' day. Well, the pendulum has swung all the way to the other end of the spectrum in our day. And what we have today is antinomianism has so infiltrated the church that the prevailing attitude among many professing Christians is a lot of times, oh, this or that isn't any big deal. You know, even if you bring up a, a point of doctrine or something that scripture says, oh, you know, it's it's not that big of a deal. You're just being a Pharisee. Right. So today what happens is that we've got this pre- this false teaching prevailing of antinomianism, or sometimes people call it greasy grace, you know, yeah. but taking advantage of grace. And because they are so caught up in this false teaching of antinomianism, they see those of us who follow Jesus and follow what his word says as legalists or Pharisees. So it's not, it's, it's always the people in the middle, like Jesus and his followers in his day, uh, his followers today. It's the people who are in the middle, not at one end or the other of the spectrum that get called the names, you know, (laughs) they get called in Jesus day. They were, they were called disobedient to scripture because they weren't following all the legalism. And today we're called Pharisees because we're not following all the, uh, you know, it's no big deal of the antinomian. So I think that has a lot of effect on it too. Yeah. And and I'm struck by the fact it it is ironic that uh, those who are doing the name calling, you're a Pharisee and playing that card uh, are it, it, the opposite is, actually true. So uh, it's it's the people defending the false teachers who are, are being pharisaical. Uh, you know, right. th- those are the Pharisees who are accepting or even bringing in uh, false teaching into the church, which is exactly what the real Pharisees did back then, you know, bring, you know, adding to or subtracting from scripture. So um, I, I just find it uh, kind of strange that people have completely turned around uh, the definition of a Pharisee and what they were all about is kind of the you know, the good is evil and evil is good that you see. And and I, I look at a lot of this coming from the progressive church, the, the you know, not necessarily liberal, although there's some of that going on, but, um, but the progressives are the ones who really don't take God at his word. They, they really don't have any use for uh, scripture as authority. They really don't have any use for, uh, you know, abiding by scripture. It's just kind of a loose suggestions that they think people made up and embellished over the years, like playing telephone as Bibles were being, you know, transcribed. And that could not be farther from the truth. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, we have got to, I mean, thinking about how the Pharisees were in Jesus' day and thinking about how, like I was talking about, about the the antinomians and you're talking about the progressives, how they are in our day. We It just should show us how important it is to be in the word and to really be good students of the word so that we can make sure that we're obeying exactly what the word says and we're not, you know, falling into a ditch on the left side of the road or falling into a ditch on the right side of the road. You know, we're not adding to scripture and we're not taking away from scripture. We're just obeying scripture as it is is written. So I, th- I think that's really something we can take away from, from this whole discussion is be in the word, be good students of the word, do like second Timothy two fifteen says, and, and handle the word correctly and, uh, and make sure you're understanding it correctly and obey what it says. And you won't be an antinomian or a Pharisee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's really helpful. And I, I think there may be some listeners who might not be familiar with studying the Bible. And both Michelle and I have Bible studies on our websites. Michelle, you've got it on michellelesley.com. Mm-hmm. And I've got Bible studies on naomistable.com. And I think we can put links there in our show notes um, to help people uh, consider how to study the Bible and really get more meat out of it than maybe you would on your own if you've never studied the Bible before on your own or you've never been taught how to read scripture. So, uh, so it's it's good to do it either way. But, uh, but I think that uh, any any additional resources we're going to put there. Yes, I think that's great. You know, we're going to put some some articles in the show notes that'll help you to discern the truth and and uh, know how to handle these situations where you know maybe somebody's calling you a Pharisee or whatever. So. 
As we wrap up this episode, we encourage you to dig deeper and head over to our website for those links. You can find our resources and other podcast episodes at a wordfitlyspoken.life. And while you're there, please consider supporting this ministry through prayer and through your gifts via PayPal or Patreon to help offset the website and podcast costs. Yeah, we really appreciate those. So thank you so much for those who do. And until next time, know the truth, stand firm in the truth, and speak the truth as always as you walk worthy.